Good evening. If you follow the news these days, you might be tempted to despair. It sometimes seems as though a new age has started in which forces beyond our control are hurling our planet and all its inhabitants to annihilation. The world's most powerful countries openly turn towards nationalism, xenophobia, militarism, rattling their nuclear swords. And in our darkest moments, we sometimes think that there's nothing that can stop it. But there's another reality, one that mostly flies under the radar, but is no less powerful. I'm referring to the hundreds of thousands of organizations, millions of people around the world, who work day and night to restore, rebuild, connect, protect, and heal. Never before in the history of humankind have there been so many people working for a sustainable world of equality, justice, and peace. And even if we don't hear about it every day, it's there. And something new is happening because many of the most innovative change makers these days are coming from the arts. Filmmakers, theater makers, writers, dancers, singers, devoting their art to not only to exploring the ideas of a different world, which has always been one of the function of the arts, but also helping to nurture it into being. I'd like to speak this evening about war, fear, empathy, and music. Most of us have come to understand that the extreme wealth in some parts of the world comes at the cost of extreme poverty and misery in the rest. People, of course, all need to survive and all want a good life. So in this world of inequality, they try to change things, and this often results in conflict, as we also all know. And these conflicts lead very often to the ultimate disconnect, which we call war. Meanwhile, you and I, human beings of this planet, are pitted against each other, persuaded that the real threats are not this system of inequality, but rather our neighbors who have a different skin color or a different religious background, a different ideological belief or a different national origin. And why would we go along with such a system? Why would we, we be okay with a world which is based on the unequal distribution of resources held into place by domination and war? What keeps that vicious cycle going? What fuels that disconnect? I think there's a one-word answer to that, and I think it's fear. When I was growing up in the US, we were taught to be afraid of the communists, the Russians, the Chinese, insurgents, spies. They were everywhere. Under every mailbox was actually the phrase. When we went to school, we had to participate in air raid drills, hiding under our desks or ducking and covering, as it was called, in the hallways with our arms on our shoulders to prevent us from being hurt in a nuclear war. People were encouraged to build bomb shelters in their basements, truly, with saltines and canned fish and stuff like that. And there were hearings held, congressional hearings. People like me, musicians, artists, writers, scientists, teachers, lost their jobs were blacklisted. Some people went to prison. A few were even executed. 
And meanwhile, there was a terrifying arms race. And we grew up under the shadow of the bomb. So, then, some decades later, when the Berlin Wall fell, and we didn't have to be afraid of the communists anymore, suddenly there were other villains. As I remember, Gaddafi was one of the first. Saddam, the axis of evil. Iran, Iraq, North Korea. Since 9-11, the terrorists. And now even refugees, even people fleeing from war, are on the fear list. We're supposed to be afraid of them. Statistics actually show that you're more likely to die falling out of your bed than by a terrorist attack. But fear works. Fear works because it puts us in our fight-or-flight mode. It makes it harder for us to think creatively, or to think critically, for that matter. So politicians and media can evoke images of threats to us, and we will gladly allow them to do whatever they want. And that keeps that system in place. So what can we do, you and I, as change makers today? What do we have in our human storeroom, our human filing cabinet of capacities to counter fear? Empathy. We have empathy. The human capacity to understand the other, to stand in the other's shoes, to feel the other's feelings, to mirror the other, to feel the pain of the other, to share in the joys. Empathy is the glue of human relationships. It's part of our DNA. Our capacity for empathy is why we, at one point, as a species in our evolution, came out of our caves and joined in groups, larger and larger and larger groups, such as even today international gatherings, like this one. So, what might be the connection between empathy and music? I've always made music. I grew up in a singing community, and I was taught some instruments, and I learned a few more. And I spent many years as a choir director and leading singing ensembles. And of all the experiences, all the wonderful experiences that I've had with music, the ones that touched me the most were always when that music did something to shift consciousness, change the energy, transform a dynamic or deepen a connection. Sometimes that was just in a concert where listeners and performers could sort of get into a shared space of understanding and appreciation of something beautiful that was happening but also in social movements, peace movements, civil rights movements, freedom movements. People sing to bring them together and to give each other courage to face perhaps police violence, arrest, imprisonment. But singing connects and gives people courage. Once a choir member in one of my groups who had completely lost the use of her voice by an operation, a throat operation, amazed us when we went by to see her and to sing for her. And when her favorite song came along, she started singing. Twice, we've sung ourselves across hostile borders when guards didn't want to let us through. And when we started making music, slowly, you saw the smiles coming. And then the gates opened. Three times, we have helped people to die peacefully, surrounding them with loving voices. In all of these, all of these experiences, it was the music that in a situation of fear, anxiety, or suspicion, brought calm and connection. Today, neuro and behavioral scientists are 
exploring what many musicians have known for many years from their own experience. That making music and being part of music not only can help you, for example, to learn a language or to do better at math, but making music also decreases stress, decreases the tendency to be aggressive, increases concentration and focus, and helps us to cooperate with each other. Research with young children, youth, older people, people suffering from dementia or Parkinson's or autism, show across the board that making music, especially making music with others, increases the ability to connect back to oneself and with the other. In this shared space of music, what is happening there is empathy. So fear causes disconnection. Empathy helps to counter fear. And music creates empathy. On these principles, almost 18 years ago, a group of musician friends got together and started what we thought of as a new kind of peace organization. And we called it Musicians Without Borders. Today, we work in many places around the world with our fellow musicians there to use the power of music to help to strengthen communities, to cross divides, and to heal the wounds of war. I'd like to share with you a couple of examples to give an idea of how, in how many ways, music can be applied to this very basic grassroots form of peace building. First, Kosovo. The end of the Kosovo War in 1999, the city of Mitrovica in northern Kosovo was left divided by the river that runs through it, with the ethnic Serbs on the north side of the river, the Albanians on the south side. The bridges had been destroyed. They were rebuilt by international forces. But today, almost 20 years later, those bridges are barricaded, and almost no one dares to climb over the rubble and cross to the other side. And the suspicion and mistrust that is pervasive still among the older people who were there during the conflict also gets passed on to the younger ones who never even met their peers on the other side of their own city. But Mitrovica had another history. Before the war, it was a rock and roll town. Many of the old rockers who came out into the ex-Yugoslavia music scene came from this town and its inter-ethnic, vibrant rock music scene. So after the war, some rock musicians approached us and asked for our help. And in 2008, we opened up the Mitrovica Rock School. Since that time, more than 900 young people have come through that school, learning how to play the guitar, or the bass, or the drums, or the keys, or to be a great singer, and to write and arrange their own songs, and to perform together in bands. They play in ethnically mixed bands, but we don't talk politics. We only talk music. The Mitrovica Rock School is making it normal for young people to have friends who play music with them, who come from anywhere, even the other side of their own town. Let me share with you a little bit of a recent song composed and arranged by one of our newest ethnically mixed bands, young people singing about love, doing what they love to do. Oh dear. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's rock music. <laughs> Imagine. 
is very loud. <laughs> so the only thing, the only way you're going to be able to see this actually is going to be able to go to musicianswithoutborders.org and look at the Mitrovica Rock School and go to the movies on there. And then you will see this wonderful group called Proximity Mine singing their song, which is called Moi, which is sort of how I'm feeling right now, but that's fine. <laughs> So, oops, something happened. Something happened again. But not what I was hoping for. Oh, okay, just a second. We have another silent movie. <laughs> can, we, can we go back one slide, please? Oh, no, dear. Well, I'm going to tell you the story then. I was going to tell you the story about Rwanda, because that's another place where we work. There we go. Wonderful. Um, Rwanda, a very different place, of course, and also deeply affected by a war. In 1994, genocide in Rwanda killed almost a million people within 100 days. Hundreds of thousands were wounded. Many children left orphaned. Women were systematically raped, and many were infected with HIV. Today, we work with Rwandan musicians to try to help heal some of those wounds of war. And what we do is we train them to be community music leaders, to be able to work with the children who are the most vulnerable in their community. So children who are affected by HIV, the orphans and refugees. We have trained up to now about 80 young Rwandans as community music leaders, and they work with 30,000 children on a regular basis. Now let's see if we can listen to Eve, who is one of our musicians, who tells in this video, I'm telling you ahead of time, how music helped him to survive his own history in the war, and how he is now trying to pass it on to children in his own community. There we are. I saw Michael Jackson, I saw Trish Chapman, and if those people were inspired me a lot to become a musician. My parents used the music just to forget they are, that they are refugees in Burundi. Once they sang and they danced they they have, uh, Rwandan music, they could feel that they are home. Uh, I wasn't raised by Mama and, uh, and the uh, I could feel this loneliness in me because I didn't get uh, the, that affection from my mom. But the music helped me not just to think, to be a prism of the, the thoughts. And the, I used the music to, to make myself happier. What well, I can share in the maybe come up with new ideas, new thoughts, how we can use music to, uh, to help our community, to help, to heal. Music makes a, a big impact. Maybe it, it can be something a little short, you can see it with your eyes, but you, you can see it with, uh, with time. Don't you know I'm talking about revolution And then one more example, Palestine. Like Rwanda, children grow up in Palestine in the context of conflict. Every life is affected by it. Children grow up with daily violence, the threat of um, army incursions, people being arrested, tear gas attacks, and in great poverty, many of them. And so there, we work with the most vulnerable children, with those living in refugee camps and isolated villages. Oh, okay. Sorry. And um, some of the young people that we've trained as community music leaders were enthusiastic rappers. So we helped them to build a studio where they could record their raps. 
we brought uh, some DJs to teach them how to make their own beats, and we gave them some didactic training so they could work with children. And today, these young rappers work with children to teach them how to write their own raps so that they can express their hopes and dreams. Watch these two, who are, they're two young rappers working with chronically ill children, teaching them the very basis of rhythm. Shall we join them? One, two, three, four. Technique's fault, it's just me and technology. <laughs> so, in each of these places, what happened? That's not. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm back. There's another beautiful drawing that I really want you to see this one. Um, all these drawings, by the way, made by Laura Fisser, who is sitting in the hallway somewhere. Um, in all of these places Kosovo, Rwanda, Palestine, it is music that is creating the safe space to be who you are. It is music that is creating the empathy that allows these people to connect, and us as well. And it is music that gives the place for creation and connection. In a world that is full of war and fear, we see the power of music bringing hope and healing every single day. And that is a reason not to despair. In music, we have the most powerful voice for empathy, for connection, and for peace. We say, war divides, music connects. I thank you.